this is uh, Richard Rabat and Brian McQuaid from Google who are going to talk about PageSpeed. Thank, thank you. And uh, we're a little early, so if you guys want to go a little long, that's fine. Okay. okay. So I'm Richard Rabat. I'm a product manager, and Brian McQuaid is the engineer in Cambridge that actually did a lot of the development on PageSpeed. And uh, briefly, in terms of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to present what PageSpeed is, uh, how you know we decided to like you know build it, and then it, it basically go over a few cool features. And actually, we're going to we decided to put the demo before you know at the beginning to kind of like uh, motivate people to actually listen to us about like the cool features that we have, and we'll basically be identifying some and use JavaScript, pointing out the inefficient CSS selectors, and also describing a cool feature that like, a bunch of people have been talking about that we release in PageSpeed, which is the activity panel. Uh, what it is, it's basically a Firefox Firebug add-on. Uh, we're very lucky to be, to be able to use the capabilities of Firebug to actually like, do the development that we had. We're inspired by uh, Yahoo's Wiselow. I guess Steve actually built uh, Wiselow back at Yahoo when he was there. Uh, the, the big thing that we wanted to do when we released it is that we, from day one, wanted to be open source and open repository. So uh, all the code is on code.google.com slash p slash page speed. And we really welcome contributions. So please submit uh, change lists. Uh, bug features, feature requests, please help us develop this tool. Uh, so some of the optimizations that we do, uh, we do in the add-on when we, when we can. So we tell you that, for example, the image is not that compressed, that you could uh, compress it losslessly more, but we also give you the actual optimized image. So just you know, take it and throw it on your website and you'll be fine. Uh, we also minify the JavaScript. A lot of people will, will do the development of the JavaScript, and that's the, that's the file that they will use on their, you know, on their web server. And a lot of these files have basically comments, white space, it's just bits on the wire that make no sense to ship on the wire. And what you need on your web server is basically as few bits as possible. And uh, another piece that's really cool is the fact that PageSpeed will tell you some of the JavaScript you don't need to, to load initially when you load the page. Uh, a few nice stats. Uh, so we released it on June 4. Within 10 days, we had 100,000 downloads, thousands of tweets. We love Twitter. This is like the best feedback mechanism we've had. We have, you know, we have a moderator page. We have, a, you know, a Google Groups, but like all the feeds actually were on Twitter. And then hundreds of blog posts, which were, uh, which was quite nice. A lot of people, like you know, talking about like you know what we can do to improve, but also like you know some of the cool features that we have. Uh, and why did we develop it? So basically, uh, we noticed at Google that like a bunch of teams were doing a lot of optimizations, and each one in their own world. Obviously, the search team was doing as many optimizations based on speed. Uh, uh, for speed that they could. Other, the image search team was working on other things. And what we wanted with PageSpeed is basically make sure that like, the best practices that are learned by, an, by one team are not relearned really again by another team and, and new apps. And uh, we also spent a lot of time basically looking, on the, you know, looking at best practices on the internet uh, to give us ideas about like, you know, what what makes sense in terms of like improving the performance of your website. Uh, and so we implemented all this and uh, we started running that as part of like, you know, the re regression models that we, that we run so that we don't uh, you know, start getting regressions as well for products that are out, out in the wild. And uh, so basically we spent a lot of time really crafting these, uh, this implementation. And so one of, the, uh, one of the things we looked at, for example, is proxy and browsers. And here, Brian's going to start talking about this as well. Yeah, so, so over time, we've you know, learned about different sort of uh, uh, quirky behaviors of various browsers and proxies, and you know, where we find that those behaviors can actually adversely impact performance. We've sort of tried to roll that logic right into the tool so that you can just benefit from you know, what we've learned by you know, experimenting with different apps. Um, and different browsers and proxies. So for instance, we know that 
uh, Internet Explorer, uh, certain variants of the very header can make uh, content uncacheable in the browser. So you might use the very header uh, for one purpose, not realizing that you're actually inhibiting caching and IE and actually hurting your users. So we rolled that logic right into the tool, uh, and we'll tell you about that in those cases. And likewise, uh, HTTP proxies, so the squid proxy, for instance, uh, uh, tends to, it does not cache anything with a question mark in the URL, even if that content is marked as uh, public proxy cacheable. So uh, this is something that we actually learned from a really interesting blog post out on the web. Um, uh, that uh, someone had did a deep dive of squid cacheability for Google Maps, and what they found was actually all of our map tiles had a question mark in them. We didn't realize that was inhibiting caching, but in response to that, we uh, you know made a fix to Google Maps, uh, you know removed that question mark in the URL, and as a result, Maps saw a big reduction in bandwidth utilization for map tiles. So um, that's something else we've rolled into the tool to sort of uh, you know make that knowledge just accessible to everybody and sort of easy to get at. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm going to do the little demo now. Um, uh, we'll just sort of look at uh, PageSpeed in the browser here. So we're going to run PageSpeed on CNN.com. And you essentially, so it's sort of running through the rules, analyzing the resources on the page, minifying JavaScript, optimizing images. And then once all that's done, uh, we get back a nice sort of list, of, you know, ordered list of, it looks like the edge. Is the edge of the um, presentation clip? In any case, uh, if, if well, sure. Well, yeah. it, uh, so, uh, off to the side there a bit, there's a, um, uh, uh, you know, we essentially sort of uh, categorize the rules, yes, by, uh, you know, sort of high importance, sort of modern importance, and then at the bottom, as you scroll down, you actually see, you know, things that the site is doing well, or things that might not apply to the site. And so then, you know, if you're sort of curious, you know, why should I adopt gzip compression, you know, we suggest as the top rule, you can expand and sort of, you know, learn specifically, you know, what the benefit is, you can save over 300K of, uh, downloading, um, and then see specifically which resources that applies to and which ones you'll get the biggest benefit from. So, you know, we've got other rules in here as well, and each of them expands, uh, you know, one that's interesting, you know, we can show you essentially, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a moment, um, uh, you know, that certain JavaScript functions were not called by the time the onload handler was invoked. These are candidates perhaps for defer loading, um, so you can actually drill down and see specifically you know, which functions within each, each file were uncalled by the time onload was invoked and sort of, you know, make decisions about whether or not you want to try to defer load those. So, and then finally, if, you, uh, if you're curious and you want to learn more about any given rule, you can just sort of click through and, and link into our documentation where we've got really great extensive write-ups and sort of the why and the how of, you know, each of these rules. So, uh, so that's PageSpeed in a nutshell. I'll go back to... Um, There we go. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the identifying unused JavaScript rules. So, so you know, it's a performance best practice to, um, uh, to defer loading as much JavaScript as possible on the page. Um, but that's often hard to do. You know, you need to use some of the JavaScript to render the page and other JS you may not need, but it's hard to know which is which. So we implemented this rule to sort of help in that task. You can, you can just run the rule um, on the page. It, it, you know, as the page is being loaded, we. Uh, observe which functions are called and which are not, and then we just, you know, present that information to you so you can know, you know, okay, I can, you know, defer this function, I should not defer that function. Um, a couple things that are, I guess, important to note about this one. One, this rule is not enabled by default in PageSpeed. Uh, it actually introduces a bit of a performance uh, hit, so we, we disable it by default. So you'll have to turn it on, run it, and then turn it off. And the other thing is, uh, you know, from page load to page load, you'll likely uh, execute different JavaScript functions. So it's important to sort of, uh, you know, you shouldn't just take, you know, all the uncalled functions and defer them. It, it makes sense to sort of evaluate in different scenarios and uh, um, identify the functions that really are candidates for deferral. So, so uh, let's see. So the, the other area that's sort of an interesting is uh, uh, inefficient CSS selectors. So we came across this really great document on the web by uh, David Hyatt. Uh, on the Mozilla website called Writing Efficient CSS for the Mozilla UI. And David basically goes into detail where he, uh, he talks about how the Firefox CSS engine works, how it matches selectors, and uh, um, you know, then sort of identifies which selectors are efficient, which are inefficient. And so what we did was we sort of rolled that document into, into a rule in, in PageSpeed, and uh, you know, then we analyze all the selectors on a page and categorize them, you know, inefficient, efficient, and then give that information back to you. So that, uh, that's beneficial because it can reduce the, you know, rendering time of the page as well as sort of the interactive um, sort of snappiness factor of the page. You know, more efficient CSS selectors can make the page respond to user input more quickly. 
So in addition to the rules, we have a sort of second component of page speed, which we call the activity panel, and where the page speed sort of rule set uh, analyzes uh, the page at a snapshot in time and gives you sort of specific feedback uh, based on that snapshot in time, the activity panel is, uh, is used to sort of uh, analyze the, all the activity that happens on your site uh, throughout the, page, the time of the page load. So you can see sort of where most time is being spent, um, and it can help you to sort of identify the places that you should focus uh, your optimization efforts on. Um, so, you know, at the moment we show network activity, we also show JavaScript parse and JavaScript execute activity in the tool. Uh, our goal is really to create a, a full picture from end to end so that you can see, you know, from page load, from, from page load start to page load end, you know, we fill in the timeline from end to end and there's no gaps. So going forward, we'd like to add, you know, reflow uh, time events, we'd like to add pane events and screen snapshots, uh, DOM parse, things like that. Uh, at the moment, we've got JavaScript parse and execute in there, which I believe is helpful to understand, sort of fill in some of the gaps that are missing in uh, a network-only profiler. So uh, I've got a couple screenshots here of the activity panel. Um, you know, BBC and uh, Gmail, very different looking uh, uh, screenshots. Um, the, the BBC site has a, a, a lot of room, or, or I should say there's room for optimization uh, there, so I'll focus on that and talk about some of the things uh, they could do to optimize based on analyzing this screenshot, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Gmail uh, screenshot. Gmail's already pretty well optimized, so I won't spend as much time there. So in the case of the BBC, well, I sh okay, so, so I should take a step back and just explain the activity panel first. Um, along the bottom, you can see there's sort of a, a legend that shows what each color is uh, associated with. So yellow is TCP connect time, uh, you know, dark gray or, or black is DNS lookup, red is JavaScript parse, and blue is JavaScript execute. And then on the left of each trace, you've got the URLs, uh, the resources on the page, and on the right, you've got the activity for each of those resources. So what we see is that, or, or what I do when I look at one of these traces, is I try to identify the resources that are in the critical path of the page load, and usually what that means is the resources that, when they're active or loading, nothing else is going on on the page at that time. And by focusing on those resources in the critical path, you can be pretty confident that if you can reduce the time uh, needed for those resources, you can reduce the overall load time of the page. So in this case, in the BBC case, what we see is we've got about uh, eight or nine resources there at the top, and they're actually pretty well parallelized. You've got CSS and the main page. And uh, so given that they're parallelized and overlapping, it may not make sense to start the optimization process there, whereas uh, the last three resources on the page uh, are totally serialized, you know, one, two, three there. Um, and those are actually JavaScript files. This is in Firefox 3 where JavaScript is serialized. And we end up spending more time fetching those three files here than we do fetching the eight or nine or 10 files at the top of the page. So, so it makes sense to start the optimization process with those files. And then drilling down on those a little bit, we can actually see that a significant amount of time is spent uh, doing DNS lookups for, for the last two resources. So uh, about half of the you know, second to last resource is just blocked in DNS lookup, just waiting for the response to come back. And the latter one is almost entirely a DNS lookup uh, 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 almost all the time is attributed to DNS lookup. Now, I guess it's important to note that every activity panel uh, snapshot will look different. You know, you may or may not have to perform a DNS lookup every time uh, you visit a page. So this is just one of many, but it does show how, uh, you know, DNS lookups can really adversely impact performance, especially on uh, JavaScript files. Um, so to fix that issue, we can just move those resources from, th so those are hosted on new domains, that's why we have to perform the DNS lookup. We can just move those resources to the page's main host name, news.bbc.co.uk, and co be confident that the browser won't have to perform a lookup for that uh, host name because it's already done so in the past. So it does make sense to parallelize resources in some cases, uh, but JS, because it's usually serialized, you, you, you don't benefit from parallelization as much, and actually, in this case, you're actually hurt by, uh, by moving the JS to a different domain. So it's definitely, in the case of BBC, uh, could significantly reduce page load time. And then the other thing we can do is just combine those JavaScript files into one or just a few, maybe one loaded early and one loaded uh, late. Um, by doing that, we sort of uh, reduce the impact of this uh, serialization sort of stepping of you know, fetching all the JavaScript files. So those two things alone can significantly reduce the time spent uh, you know, with those, two J with those uh, JS files. There are other things you can do as well, um, but the, it, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, in short, what I, what I do is, you know, I run the activity panel, I look for where most of the time is going, and then I go back to the PageSpeed tool, run that on the page, 
look for suggestions that are associated with you know, where most of my time is being spent, and then make those optimizations, come back to the panel after doing so, and I expect to see that the time spent in that uh, window of time has been reduced by those optimizations. So sure enough, PageSpeed will tell you, move those two resources to the same domain as the page, and it will tell you to combine the external JS files, uh, both of which we see uh, contribute to the latency of this page. So that's uh, the BBC. Um, by contrast, Gmail, uh, we know is a, a JavaScript-heavy Ajaxy app. They do a lot of JS parse and JS execute, so it might be tempting to say to yourself, well, if I can reduce the amount of time spent parsing and executing JavaScript for Gmail, I should be able to reduce the page load time. But in this particular trace, at least, what we see is that's actually not true. Um, along the bottom, we see, this, so the bottom most uh, uh, sort of row is the JavaScript, main JavaScript file for Gmail. And what we see is that the JavaScript parse and execute is parallelized with the uh, network um, download of that resource. Um, so it's hard to see, but the, there's sort of a very light gray bar at the top of the, above the red and the blue. Um, so, so what this tells us is actually if we, and, and you can see too that the JavaScript, hmm. <laughs> Uh, you can see that the JavaScript parse and execute actually have sort of gaps in them where the, the, the parse engine is essentially waiting on the network to deliver more data. So what this tells us is at least for this trace, if we reduce the amount of time spent parsing and executing the JavaScript, we won't have any impact on the you know, sort of end user page load time. What we really need to do is reduce the size of that file being downloaded off the network uh, because at least for this trace, obviously it's gonna be different for every you know, network configuration, whether it's in cache or not. Um, you know, the, the limiting factor is the download of that actual resource. So it's just a couple of um, different traces and, and just, you know, um, explanations sort of how we use the two tools together to sort of understand where the time is going and then choose the optimizations we want to apply based on that information. Um, so uh, just a couple websites, uh, you know, we, I think it's gone. Oh. Um, Code.google.com slash speed slash page dash speed. Uh, is uh, the, the primary site, you can go download the tool there. Uh, we actually just released an update that's Firefox 3.5 compatible, so a lot of folks had been asking for that. We just released that yesterday, so if you were looking for that in the past, please do uh, check in there. It's, it's uh, marked as beta right now, but we'll probably push that to everybody in the next few days. And then the open source hosting site is at code.google.com slash p slash page dash speed. So we welcome feedback, we welcome code contributions, um, and then we have discussion groups as well, so we definitely welcome feedback from the community. We want to make the tool better and make it generally useful for the community at large. And, and so we're very humbled with the, you know, with the response we've had with PageSpeed, and we're very happy that a lot of people are paying attention to all these tools that are out there that contribute to making the web, uh, you know, to giving a better and faster web experience to everybody. And we're hoping that this conversation, you know, goes to, you know, goes to help the web become faster. Thank you.